Hi, I'm Amel Sarouk, an associate publisher at Just World Books, joining you today from the lands of the Massachusetts and Pawtucket peoples. And it is my great privilege to welcome you to From Bethlehem to Gaza, Palestinian Culinary Resilience and Liberation with Leila El Haddad and Vivian Sansor. This event, uh, I'll be moderating tonight's conversation, but I'd like to thank Penny Rosenwasser for conceiving and organizing today's discussion and Dean Berdoka for helping run the technical pieces of our time together. This event will be a conversation. Oh, sorry, is my, is everything working? Sorry. Okay, great. Uh, this event will be a conversation amongst friends and I'd like to invite you all in the audience to submit any questions you have in our chat box, which I'll be monitoring as Leila and Vivian introduce us to dishes from Gaza and Bethlehem while discussing challenges to Palestinian food sovereignty and this moment of new imagining for Palestine. So do keep an eye on the chat box and feel free to ask questions throughout tonight's conversation. Please also note that this event is being recorded and a link will be sent to all registrants along with the recipes presented today. Tonight's event is being co-sponsored by Just World Educational, a small but feisty nonprofit that works to build the informed public that's needed if we want to build a more just and sustainable world. And today's webinar is the fifth in Just World Ed's Beyond Survival series, which debuted in November 2020 on food sovereignty struggles in Palestine and elsewhere. And I'd like to invite you to visit our Beyond Survival online learning hub, where you can find our earlier webinars and related resources. This event is also co-sponsored by the Middle East Children's Alliance, or MECA, which works to protect the rights and improve the lives of children in the Middle East through aid, empowerment, and education. MECA provides humanitarian aid, partners with community organizations to run projects for children, and supports income generation projects. And tonight's discussion is also a celebration of the third edition of the now iconic Gaza Kitchen Cookbook, A Palestinian Culinary Journey. Uh, co-authored by Leila Al-Haddad and Maggie Schmidt, and which was launched earlier this summer. This timely update of the much-loved, award-winning cookbook includes new stories, recipes, and photos gathered by Leila during her last visit to Gaza with the World Food Program in 2019. And we'll have more information on how to order your copy of this very special edition at the end of today's webinar. So now we're going to show you a short video from the Middle East Children's Alliance, who is co-sponsoring this event. Funds generated from tonight go towards Mecca's programs in Gaza, bringing clean water to thousands of children and their families and providing psychosocial support for children suffering from the trauma of Israeli attacks on their homes and families.
Okay, so I'm hoping everything is working for everyone. Do please message us in the chat if uh, if the video is troublesome again. Uh, but thank you again to our partners at Mecca for making this webinar happen. It's an honor for me to now introduce our amazing speakers who will be through our discussion tonight. So we have with us Leila El Haddad, who is the co-editor of numerous books, including Gaza and Silence, also author of Gaza Mom, Palestine, Politics, Parenting, and Everything in Between. And of course, co-author of The Gaza Kitchen, A Palestinian Culinary Journey, which was named Arab Cuisine Book of the Year in 2012 by Gourmand Magazine. Layla is a powerful public speaker, as you will hear, an accomplished writer, political analyst, social activist, and policy advisor. Born in Kuwait to Gaza Palestinian parents, Layla currently lives with her family in Maryland. So hi, Layla. Hi, and I apologize for the technical difficulties. We weren't sure if it was going to rain or not. So in the end, I decided to um, stick to the kitchen and then I might transfer outside if the sky looks clear. I just didn't want to get soaked. So yeah, hope it all works out. And also with us is Vivian Sensor, artist, storyteller, researcher, conservationist, and founder of the Palestinian Heirloom Seed Library. A culinary historian and enthusiastic cook, Vivian brings threatened varieties back to the dinner table to become part of our living culture rather than a, a relic of the past. She uses sketch, image, film, soil, seeds, and plants to enliven old cultural tales in contemporary presentations and to advocate for seed conservation and the protection of agro-biodiversity as a cultural political act. Vivian has spoken and exhibited her art in places across the world from Istanbul to New York and Chicago. Uh, born in Jerusalem, Vivian lives in Bethlehem, Palestine, Los Angeles, USA, and now Cambridge. Leila, Vivian, it's so great to be with you. Likewise, it's so exciting. Uh, did we lose Leila? Hi, nice to meet you. No, no, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear oh, you. Okay, I don't know. It must have been at my end. Uh, yeah, it's great to be also with all of you and uh, also to learn that Amalia, you're right here down the street uh, from Cambridge. So that's that's good to know. Do you think you could start by telling us how you first met? Yeah, how did we first meet Vivian? I think we actually didn't meet in person. It was through Vivian's work at the, um, the IMU, right? The Institute for Middle East Understanding. Yeah, and also, um, so we met like that online and then uh, I met Maggie Schmidt in uh, Madrid. Okay, okay. Who is your co-author? Yes, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I met you in New York. Uh, the IMEU was having its uh, gala. Yeah. And uh, we tried to, and the BBC asked me to uh, record an interview with you. So oh. we sat on the roof of, of, of a hotel in New York City and helicopters and we tried to communicate and I oh my gosh I forgot there. about that yeah. <laughs> it seems like ages ago yes yes okay yeah so, and then yeah. our paths kind of intersected right like we had mutual friends in um, Riyadh Bahur who's a professor and lecturer in Sacramento and also um, you know big Palestinian uh, you know food slash farm uh, you know advocate and activist and so forth and and then we both kind of moved forward in our own fields, right? In different areas, seeds, farms, food. And we kept sort of crossing paths, right? Over the years. Um, and um, when, I, when I went and filmed with Anthony Bourdain and Reza, also we intersected then. So we just, uh, you know, sort of- Yeah, I think that was when we actually worked the most together because yeah. we were coordinating the trip. And right. And, and you know, but it speaks to the sort of the, the theme of the evening, which is we were working in similar areas in parallel fields, but because it's so difficult to actually, you know, physically, um, you know, travel and be together in Palestine and, and collaborate um, in person, a lot of our work has been, even before COVID, virtual or over the phone, just because of the, uh, you know, the realities of the, of the occupation and uh, restrictions on travel and so on. Yeah, and also uh, how amazing it was that, uh, you know, you're from Gaza, but actually I only met you in New York, uh, right. which for me in itself was um, 
so disturbing. I, I was very excited when uh, Leila's book came out because um, I grew up uh, with my father and mother taking us almost every Sunday from Bethlehem to Gaza uh, because it was a very short hour drive. Uh, wow. And we would eat uh, in uh, Matam Salam. <laughs> uh, we would eat a uh, shrimp, and I, I remember uh, just the markets in 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 Gaza so well as a child, and how much that influenced the way I saw food. And uh, also because in Gaza, I got to see so many foods that I wouldn't see in Bethlehem at all. Like my first uh, sugar cane. Uh, I had in Gaza and I was fascinated as a kid, like, oh, what is this? And my dad would bring it home and, you know, peel it and cut it up for us. So for me, um, uh, I was introduced to sugar in Gaza. <laughs> well, and even just hearing those stories, because now as, as you know, anyone who's familiar knows that's an impossibility, right? It's easier for you. It's easier for us to meet in New York or probably on the moon than it is to meet in the yeah. rest right now. So, I mean, it's it's so hard to imagine that not that long ago, this was possible, right? Your father could make these daily trips and you could, you were introduced to a different part of the country and the, you know, the flavors and, the, and, the, and so on. Um, yeah, and it was uh, actually quite, I don't know, I'm, I'm probably one of the last generations who remembers right. that because I think I was probably 12 or 14 yeah. when uh, that no longer became possible. And it was, it was a big um, trauma for all, obviously for everybody, because that was like the place we went and all yeah. the friends that my family had. Um, so it, it suddenly just boom, disappeared. And as a kid, I couldn't understand why we couldn't go anymore. Yeah, and I think it's, it's not something that's clear to a lot of people, even these days. They still can't fully grasp the idea that Palestinians cannot travel freely within their own land. Like it still doesn't make sense. It seems so absurd, right? Mm -hmm. That a Palestinian from Gaza can't travel freely to you know, Bethlehem or Jerusalem or, or, and vice versa. Um, no, but even till this day, I have such a hard time conveying this very you know, uh, violent concept to people, I should say. But I do remember also like in the 90s seeing Palestinians, 1948 Palestinians and others in the early 90s, um, coming to Gaza, going to the beach, et cetera, for the day, so. Yeah. Uh, well, here we are. <laughs> and that's why your book uh, was so exciting and inspirational for me anyway. And I know for many, many people uh, because uh, it was a window for a lot of us in the West Bank, for example, who have been severed uh, from that coastal cuisine and culture to actually, you know, have a window through this book. Yeah, I mean, that was the idea. I thought, how can I introduce and story and stories of Gaza as part and parcel of, of Palestine um, in a way that is, you know, real and, um, you know, material and tangible and something that sticks with them, you know, because of this very problem, right? is having constantly having to face this issue of you know how do i convey um you know the palestinian experience of Gaza to people and i was it seemed like i was always telling the same, same story and i was failing um and so this idea came to me of you know doing it through through something so sensual like the flavors and something so amazing as we know that's that's so packed right it's not just about the food as we know um sorry just one second what is it really bad time. Can you tell him to call Baba? I'm in the middle of it. Go. <laughs> There's like a plumber at the door. I'm like, no, not a good time. <laughs> but anyway, so that was exactly the idea. And, you know, I don't want to belabor the point too much because I actually want to, you know, um, start cooking something. But it seemed like such an absurd idea at the time, right? Of course, you get it. Most people in this, you know, realm, this universe understand that, you know, um, food and recipes are about much more than, than just nourishment. But at the time, it seemed like very absurd, almost frivolous to people, right? Like, why would you be um, writing about Gaza in this way with everything that's going on? It seems like such a cruel, you know, um, fate to subject it to or, or irony. Um, and I wasn't sure myself, like, you know, is this something I'm just doing so I can say, 
you know, get it off my chest. Like I've always wanted to do this, right? You know, since I was young, I recognized that there was something really interesting about the food and that the food told an incredibly interesting story in and of itself, right? And that it perhaps it was, like you said, a window. It was kind of, a, you know, a different way, a passage through which we could introduce the broader world um, to this issue that in a way that wasn't reductionist and, and caricatured and the, the same kind of old thing, victimizing. Um, and so I always wanted to do it, but I wasn't sure how will it be received kind of thing, you know? And I'm still always uncertain, but it just makes me very happy that I was able to at least codify this knowledge, kind of introduce it to the world, open up, um, you know, these conversations and, and enlighten people that, okay, you know, yes, we exist and we eat and we love and we live and we're, we're you know, uh, you know, also separated where we're living in isolation, separated from like our brethren and the rest of our country and so on and so forth. But we still, there's people, right, that need to cook and eat every day. And how do they go about doing that? And what does that tell us about their lives and the situation and so on? Yeah. And um, <laughs> I, I was, yeah, we can keep uh, going now. I, I want to hear also, I mean, but I want, I'm also conscious of the time um, about Ruby and how you got started and interested in, in, you know, seed preservation. And because when we first met, you were initially so far away from that, taking a different path. And then suddenly you were like, this is my passion. I want to go back and pursue it. Forget the PhD that I'm doing. And I remember that moment clearly. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I mean, I do. Too. <laughs> it was one of the greatest moments of my life. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't, I think it wasn't, um, it, it wasn't, so sudden actually for me i mean it probably looks sudden <laughs> to the outside world right um but um for me i think it's the same like i had this constant longing right for 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 my childhood that i was told that wasn't valuable unless i got a degree from some university i was not right. you know <laughs> i felt like I mean, I, for a long time, believed the dominant world's narrative that we need degrees to be, uh, you know, to be validated. To be valid and legitimate, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then when I discovered that actually I'm not so interested in that and I would very much want to follow my heart and my heart was definitely not in academia, which is ironic because now I'm <laughs> I'm in the heart of it, but um, but I'm in the heart of it in a different way. Like in the end, it flipped where like academia now came to me rather than me going to it. Because I think even within the academic world, there's right. an understanding now that, you know, maybe, well, hopefully uh, that there's more of an understanding now that maybe we should humble ourselves and actually learn from folks who are not necessarily wearing a suit and tie. Right. Uh, and, and as climate change was and continues to be a major crisis, uh, I became more and more interested in, in, in solutions. And then uh, obviously in Palestine, as I was looking for ways to figure out where is my power in the midst of this violence, in the midst of all of this powerlessness, uh, how can I find a place where I feel an agency, not power as in dominance, but power yes. as agency. And for me, the seeds were a fantastic teacher because uh, suddenly I discovered how our ancestors basically were such um, incredible artists and diligent researchers who uh, who really worked with nature as humbly as part of it and developed for us what we have today. I mean, agriculture continues to be violent in its nature, but uh, the way I discovered like our ancestors did it wasn't as, you know, as violent as obviously today and what we do with uh, how we grow our food. And so I became fascinated also by how people, uh, throughout history, not just in Palestine, everywhere, uh, managed to interact with nature and develop culture and cuisines, uh, 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 you know, with nature. And uh, then I, you know, became very interested in wheat and how uh, Palestine is part of the center of diversity for wheat and barley and, um, and, and I, thought that said, I thought you said weeds. I was like, really? We're the center of weeds? <laughs> we. Well, 
You said wheat, right? Wheat as in bread, yeah, yeah. Not weed as in marijuana. Yeah. Although that would have been wonderful. But, um, um, yeah, and so to understand also, like even the myths in in the church, for example, I'm from Bethlehem. The whole story is about uh, Jesus having been the bread for the world, and I started to think of what does that actually um, mean? Like, what does it mean? Like the symbolism of the story even of Jesus, like bread for the world. And then I, I, I'm i now like very fascinated by this, like how also the story is a rebellious story. And uh, so anyway, I became more and more interested in seeds as a vessel to examine and to explore more ways for liberation. And I also wanted to make sure that the things I loved as a kid, uh, I didn't have to lose all of it the way I lost the sugar cane. You know what yeah. I mean? And yeah. uh, that's how it really started. It's, it's uh, sorry, one second. Small but profound. I mean, and the heart of it, right? It's about losing, like, I love what you said about um, having agency, but also the, the whole concept of not having control. I mean, so much of what, you know, central to the book is about, you know, losing control and not, you know, in all aspects of your life when you're living under Israeli occupation and this the kitchen and in your case sort of the what you're doing or the seeds being sort of um, a small little you know area a nook where you can still retain some semblance of control um, over your narrative over your you know your life over your your home and your livelihood uh, and so I think in that sense I mean it's extremely powerful um, Absolutely. I'm just going to interrupt because we have a, a question here. I think people want to hear a little bit more about the Palestinian heirloom seed library and the sort of stories that seeds tell at the end. Yeah. And while, before you begin, um, because I want to hear this too, I just want to do one thing because I'm just, I, you know, we're, we're part of this is we're going to be cooking something from, oops, from the garden. And I have these beautiful eggplants that I've grown. And I'm sure, you know, Vivian can talk more about eggplants in a little bit, but these are from my garden. And I, again, I might move outside in a little bit when it's the thunderstorm has passed, but I'm going to be making a very simple, classic Gaza summertime dish called Mfasah Hitinjan. And essentially it's, oh my God, I'm going to kill my kids. There's like someone at any point is knocking on every possible door in my house right now. <laughs> like the front door, the back door. <laughs> well, which is interesting because actually, you know, we say about kids, people describe kids as their zariya, you know, like, oh, hi, zariya. Uh -huh. uh, which literally means these are your plants. These are your yeah. seeds. Yes. And farmers, we say we want zariya, which is... Yeah, zariya. and... And in fact, yesterday I was just Tadi, 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 Zaria. Zaria. Monkey, just for this way, yeah? Yeah, should be. Okay. Shh. Melak, monkey, Mama. Please. It's not raining. It's not raining. Okay. Anyway, I was just giving the analogy yesterday to someone about um, how raising children is like cultivating a garden, and you know starting from the seed and, and caring for the garden. And it's really very similar, you know, being patient, not always being able to control the forces, um, removing the weeds, you know, tending to it. So it's true. <laughs> well, but I'm in love with the way you're handling this. I would have freaked out by now. So oh, maybe you should introduce us to your Zaria. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm used to it. As long as the audience is used to it. What do you mind about the end to the Yeah, <laughs> this is my youngest. So anyway, I was trying to say that um, it's a classic summertime dish. Very simple. You take the eggplants, you f ordinarily fry them. You can also grill them. I sometimes use my panini press and olive oil. And then you um, make a dressing in the zabdiya, which is the Gazan style mortar and pestle made out of clay of, you know, um, hot peppers, lemon, garlic, all flavors that I think Vivian and I talked about her remembering eating those kinds of flavors. We also make this dega, you know, on fish and by mulchia, um, and so on and so forth. And you just dress the eggplant with that dressing and you kind of just kind of break it apart with your hands and you eat it with bread or, um, I remember eating it in sandwiches on the beach. There would be all these little beach shacks and that's what you, the, they would serve this, you know, 
eggplant sandwiches. So that's what I'm going to make, but I just wanted to slice my eggplant and salt them while Vivian talks. So that I just wanted people to know what I was doing. Yeah, so. but Leila, I'm curious. Yeah. I'm always curious about the Zivdi. Like what, what makes it so yeah. special? Like what makes like the Zibdi more special than like getting a food processor and just oh gosh you know I I in some some sense I'm a I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to some things and in some sense I'm not but when it comes to mashing or pounding I'm always like no to the food processor it just does a horrible job at at you know there's something I think for me it's also a sensory experience of um of using a mortar pestle. And I know there's versions of it around the world in, in almost anywhere you go, right? And I always tell people, honestly, if you don't have this, just use a, a board and a any and a you know wide knife or even get like a rock. My girls sometimes do this when we're camping, just get a rock and a slab and use that. But I just love the texture of um, you know, when things are mashed versus chopped. Because when you chop garlic, you just get little pieces of garlic, right? But when you're mashing it in a mortar and pestle, it gets nice and smooth. Um, and, um, and in Reza specifically, they use this wide, you know, um, unglazed, very thick clay uh, mortar that's just kind of ubiquitous. And, um, you know, they have an old tradition of pottery making there. And they make them and often they're disposable, like they'll serve you the food and the hummus when you buy them in the morning and then you get to keep them for a very nominal price or whatever. And they come in larger sizes and they bake that shrimp that you mentioned having, you know, your friends are having tried growing up. They break, they bake the shrimp in them as well. And they make gidra, you know, which you might've had of course in Khalil and elsewhere in the large clay of vases, right? And they crack them open. But the smallest size always is used to make different versions of Gaza salad, dedga, right? With the hot peppers. And, um, but you know, why specifically this versus something else again i you know, it's just probably the the tradition of the area but again you do get a really nice grind because it's a wide surface right it's a wide yeah, and it's not glazed and it's not glazed so if you're trying to use like the ones you see in this little stores that you're not going to be able to yeah. it's too smooth you need that nice rough interior and you can grind the dill seeds and the cumin and whatever you want mash the garlic with a little salt and it gives it this nice friction, right? And it gets nice and seasoned the way a cast iron pan would. So yeah, I don't wash it in soap and water. I just rinse it out and you can smell all the beautiful flavors still in there. And people keep them for like decades, right? They keep for, if you take care of them, they keep for a very long time. Uh, so anyone, I'm, this is one of those things that anywhere you travel in the world, if you, someone that you meet from Gaza, they're very likely to have one or something similar, right? This is like central to the Gaza kitchen. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, I know. I love them. I love the way they look. I like the way they smell. I love having them. I have, I don't always use them, but I have one back home. And I can't even imagine like cooking without it. You know, anywhere I go, it's like the first piece of equipment that I, <laughs> I take. You know, so. Can you yeah. recommend uh, where people can buy them in the U.S.? Oh gosh, I don't think you can. But I always tell. I'm I'm working on like trying to work with a local potter on creating some. Because I get so many requests about them, but unfortunately, because of the blockade on Gaza, they're pretty much impossible unless you know someone personally traveling there to um, to obtain them, right? Um, and then the closest thing you can find probably is, um, you know, um, they have like they're not clay, but they have wood, wide wooden ones that I've seen that are pretty good. And sometimes you can find Thai ones that are very similar. They're clay, but they're not as as wide. You can find Thai mortars that are very similar. And then I always recommend, if none of those options work, to get a granite one. That's some, um, you know, there's some Chinese granite ones that are kind of nice as well, and they're very heavy and they mash very well. Yeah, I should say that for me, this was also major for what Gazze cuisine is in my mind. Yeah. Because uh, in our household, my father is obsessed with everything Gazze cuisine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and he loves chilies, and we always joke he's Razawi. He must yeah. be Razawi. Uh, so, uh, and he loves to make all these salsas and sauces and, yeah. all, you know, these things, and dugas, obviously. And yeah. so, in Bejala, uh, which is my town, Bethlehem area, uh, always it was so strange, like, what is this thing you add to your mluchiye dish, you know, uh -huh. like, because it was so unusual that, you know, we would, we would, my mom would make 
something like that. And she would put lemon and uh, chilies. It was very like, so it became called, uh, you know, uh -huh. uh, and in fact, uh, we're supposed to make that today, you know, for those who are watching, but we thought it might be too complicated, but I will show you the mluchia that I have growing outside from Palestine. I have some seeds, you know, so you know, speaking of seeds, <clears throat> But I try as much as I can to grow Palestine in my garden, you know? Yeah, yeah. Connection and help the kids understand in a very material way. Like, well, this is what we'll be growing at this time. And this is what we'll be growing at that time. And so on. It's not always as easy because, you know, going back to the idea of access, we don't have that kind of, um, you know, direct access that a lot of people might have. Even people who might be estranged from their countries and lands and whatever, they, they're always like a flight away or there's a store or there's something, right? But for us, physical access is so difficult that you have to rely on a network of, as far as I can remember, even as a kid, a network of travelers and, and so on to, to give you, obtain those ingredients. Like I remember growing up, um, there was a few families from Gaza. We, we were in Saudi Arabia at the time. And there was only a few families and it was the first intifada. So even then there was you know, a very laborious journey to, to cross back. We would always ask them to bring back angerada, dill seeds, mm -hmm. um, because we couldn't find them anywhere in the Gulf. And mrabba um, arasia, which is a sour plum jam made from these, I don't know if you, if you have arasia trees in Betlehem or not, but they're these gorgeous ancient trees with a sort of, um, heirloom variety of tiny green plum that's very sour that you know used to be all around the borders of Gaza unfortunately many of them were raised down by you know um Israeli forces <clears throat> when they were clearing that area for the buffer zone but they would make this very sour jam from it so we would ask for the Arasia jam and the dill seeds and the knafa that they specifically make in Gaza with walnuts you know and even till this day now, there's always very specific things we have to ask when anyone I know is traveling to Gaza, you know, that we can't obtain, obtain elsewhere. I just want to bring us back, uh, Vivian, can you talk a little bit about the Palestinian Heirloom Seed Library and the stories? That yeah, well, I mean, it definitely ties into everything we're talking about in that uh, it, it is no coincidence that Leila was growing uh, seeds in her garden because she was, uh, and is still trying to connect to um, her <laughs> culture and her cultural heritage. And so for me, initially, uh, that was what the Seed Library is about. Um, but it's also about, obviously, a bigger global issue that um, as, as farmers in Palestine, uh, we also take part in. And so um, it started with me looking for these flavors that I was missing. Uh, and then working with farmers to uh, kind of convince some of them to uh, grow them again. So, you know, if, uh, if like, for example, the white cucumber, which apparently was a cucumber that grew in the South, but before the introduction of green cucumber, and uh, it was very prevalent, people loved it. Uh, but then a few years ago when I was starting to learn about it, uh, apparently like two families only in the village of Wadi Fukin were growing it. And so we've uh, taken some of those seeds, uh, working with a lot of farmers uh, to grow, grow this variety again so that um, it can be available, not just uh, as an idea, a story from something that was, but also can we taste our history? Can we eat it? Can we, <coughs> excuse me, can we still have a relationship with it that's a living relationship? So the seed library idea um, was uh, basically and continues to be uh, a journey that we took together, like myself and working with farmers who were willing to kind of let's try, you know, and it was just really that simple. It's not, uh, it's not a seed bank with complicated uh, equipment. It was just uh, us as a community saying, uh, hey, uh, we still want to taste that. And, and often it was difficult in the beginning. I would visit people who say, oh, well, nobody wants, nobody wants this anymore, forget about it. And then having to convince folks that uh, maybe it would be a good idea. Uh, and so, but what was amazing is that in the end, um, you know, younger folks started to learn about 
new varieties. Uh, and also with each variety, like for example, now Leila is preparing the eggplants, for example, in the village of Batir, the eggplants are revered, you know, as the, the vegetable of Batir, but actually uh, a lot of the younger kids, uh, you know, don't know as much about the eggplant uh, as, you know, obviously older generation. And even worse, that a lot of the younger generation stop working the land and now work in banks or schools or whatever. Yeah. And uh, so the idea was not to just uh, bring back these seed varieties that were disappearing, which were important for our cultural survival and our ability to um, produce our own seed because we also like uh, communities around the world, we became dependent on seeds from companies that Israel provided. And so our heirloom seeds were taken away from us basically. And we lost them because we believed the lies we were told that they were primitive, that they were not uh, good enough. And so um, it was really the, the work was a process of shifting the, the thinking from oh, what we had was quote unquote primitive according to colonial standards. Uh, and uh, then saying, no, you know what? What we have is actually pretty amazing. Not just because it tastes good. It's also uh, a way and a path and an addition to the many tools that the world needs in order to combat uh, climate change. And so many uh, even farmers in the Western United States uh, they asked me for a lot of our bali seeds, which are seeds that are grown uh, with no irrigation. And that's because, uh, you know, these are seed varieties that were developed by Palestinian farmers from many, many years ago uh, that can withstand thirst. So you have almonds uh, that, you know, in California, we have a lot of droughts. Uh, well, imagine, uh, in, in Palestine, we have a lot of almonds that grow with no, rain, no, no, sorry, no irrigation. Um, and so anyway, the, the seed library is basically this journey of constantly discovering who we are, who we were and who we want to be and doing it through uh, planting these seed varieties, bringing them back to the fields and then bringing them back literally to the market and then to our dinner table. And with that, that's why, um, uh, I created the traveling kitchen, which is uh, which was a way to basically also create awareness around these varieties because it wasn't, you know, after years of working with farmers, they would say, well, but okay, wonderful. I'm growing this variety now, but people don't know about it. Uh, and so the kitchen played a role in kind of going to villages to learn the stories of people, but also, and the stories about things we didn't know about but also to, to share and say, you know what, um, you know, how can we cook these recipes that we, we, we forgot or how, how can we, uh, what can we do with these varieties that, that are old but now new? Uh, so it it's always been an interactive project and now we have a center in Batir, uh, which uh, the seed library actually lives in, but actually our work even though people can visit the seed library in Batir and can take seeds and a lot of farmers um, come and often, I, I love when especially el elders come because I mean, I love it and, I, and it makes me sad because uh, you know, when an 80 year old farmer comes asking me for seeds that they just miss having uh, because they miss it from their childhood and they heard I, I have it, uh, obviously, it makes me happy when I have it, but it also makes me sad that an 80-year-old doesn't have it anymore. Uh, so the work is really how to conserve these varieties for Palestine and for our ability to be liberated from companies that Israel completely uh, uses to control uh, our inputs in our farms. Uh, and in, to a large extent, also chemical inputs. So when when these companies sell you the seed, they also sell you all the chemicals that go with it. And so we have a major health crisis in, in rural areas, uh, in the villages in Palestine, because cancer levels are so high uh, due to like massive uh, use of uh, chemical inputs and parts. And so the seed library also is a way to have conversations about you know chemical input and 
why you know maybe investing in heirloom varieties or even natural breeding projects that uh, don't involve uh, all these uh, chemical technologies or uh, um, biotech uh, because people have been breeding uh, varieties forever uh, and why why they're important so uh, yeah and so it's exciting we have a few sites we work with uh, and uh, right now we have one particular site where we also built a cistern uh, and uh, we I was so happy to see the 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 film that you just showed us because uh, when COVID also began it was really wonderful to have farms that you can share food with uh, from uh, so anyway i mean this is what the sea library is about and uh, it continues to be an interactive project to evolve and co-evolve uh, with our own evolution as a human society and as a palestinian society hopefully yeah, thank you so much that's just just incredible um i wonder Maybe Leila can answer this as well, but uh, can you speak to the significance of cooking and, and the actual preparation of food? The significant, well, you know, it's, uh, I, I mean, personally, I find it very, you know, therapeutic and comforting, but it's also a way for me to be able to retain, sorry, the pounding is getting a little bit loud here. <laughs> For those of you who are wondering what's happening, where um, Bayan is just mashing the some garlic that I had growing in my in my garden with some uh, hot peppers and Reza, there's a very specific variety of hot pepper. I have yet Vivian to obtain that seed. I tried mm. and I failed. Like someone brought me some, but they they didn't take. I tried like ten different times. But anyway, um, so it's just the garlic salt hot peppers, hot green chilies, and then we're going to put some lemon juice. That's going to be the dressing. So Bayan is just pounding those for me. So in pickle Gaza, just put chilies and lemon. Chilies exactly. Lemon. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, there's something about that combination that when you put it on the hot, you know, fried eggplant, it soaks up all those juices and it's just amazing. So while I answer that question, I, I short-circuited my, um, something here, <laughs> my, and my panini press went like, while you were talking, it like a little fire started, but it's all good. It's under control. No, not a big fire. I joke, but but anyway, there's something about cooking as I've added these eggplants that um, like again, to me, it's some, there's something about the the you know the normality and the routine that I imagine um under a situation of you know extreme violence and stress, and especially a violence that invades your everyday life and that is a presence in your everyday life. It's it's not just. Um, there's something about it that, you know, maintain, clinging to the, to the routine and the, and the mundane is a sort of coping mechanism, right? But again, it goes back to my point about retaining control. And, uh, you know, um, you know when, when a force is trying to violate, you know, the social structure and everything about, about your life and society, being able to cling to that, that mama met in Alta, um, which helps maintain, you know, and perpetuate the history and the and the story and the culture. Something like cooking becomes then critical. It becomes, in and of itself, a form of resistance. I think, you know, um, being able to cook and to and to make the same meals, perhaps not with the same ingredients, whatever might be available to you. Sorry, Bayan thinks the chili peppers are, are telephones now. So she. I love her imagination. <laughs> Bayan, Bayan, how do you feel about the these chili peppers? What do you think we should do with them? They are spiciness, and I don't want to eat spicy things. <laughs> you bite into it? You said they're spicy, and I don't want to eat spicy things. So I'm still oh. working. I'm still working on her palates. <laughs> I keep trying to. Is she really has the way? Sure, her dad is not. So unfortunately, oh. he's, he's from the Haifa area. So, you know, they couldn't be further from spice. <laughs> yeah, so it's see. always a tug of war in our house of like trying to get the kids to, you know, accept that, no, this is food, the spice is the stuff of life, you know? Uh, Leila, I've always been curious about, um, I've always heard that kids uh, took chili sandwiches to school. Yes, yes. So, so real fact, 
Yeah, sorry, just excuse me while I check on these. No, they're still okay. So in, in fact, um, shapka, you know, the, the red chili, fermented chili paste. Um, I mean, I remember growing up, my cousins would, partly because it's like extremely affordable, partly because it's frankly very delicious. If you've ever had a shapka sandwich, it sounds crazy, but it's actually very good. Um, you know, and partly because it's also very nutritious actually. Um, but yeah, that's what would be the typical um, sort of midday snack, you know, for a lot of school children, they would just take a shapa, a shapa sandwich. So what if it's just the bread and the, and the, and the. Yeah, chicken? I'm trying to see if I have any here, just a second. Can you make us a shapa sandwich? Yeah, can I make you? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Let that's me, what I want if I come to Maryland. Give me a second to, um, to find it. I have it here. I just I mean, is this fascinating because it's like the yeah. peanut butter and jelly of, uh, I know, of vegetables. I, know. And I think also it's just one of the most widely available crops, you know, and everyone can afford it. But I mean, even before things were really dire, I still remember people doing this. So I don't think it's like directly related to the situation. Um, I think it's just a matter of taste and, you know, availability and so on. Um, but definitely my dad would tell me stories of his brother, Alayr Hamo, doing this like way back when, right? In the six, in the fifties, in the forties. So definitely it's predates the current situation. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we existed before uh, the occupation. What's that? We existed before. The I know, I know, I know exactly. Yeah. And you know, and, but speaking to, I'm going to grab the shuffle in a second and I'll show you. Um, and I'll, this is bread that I baked in my outdoor oven, by the way, I was trying to make everything, source everything from, from here, my garden. And, you know, I have a clay oven that we built during COVID. So we like to bake in it. But I mean, to, speaking to, to, to the point about a lot of the, the dishes that, you know, um, speaking to the person's question about cooking and the significance of, you know, that people make currently in Gaza, where, you know, something like now 80% of the population is, um, you know, in the, and I don't like the NGO, you know, terminologies, but what they call food insecure or, you know, unable to um, provide, um, you know, meals for themselves more than uh, twice a day, don't have a steady source of income and so on. Um, they no longer can access uh, ingredients that are central to our cuisine. That would be an afterthought, I imagine, in Bethlehem or elsewhere, like olive oil, tina, krika, right? These are luxuries now that people will purchase in um, very small quantities, like a quarter's worth or something from just for that particular dish. They'll go and get just a little ounce, you know? It's very sad. Nobody has olive oil anymore at home or most people, I should say, unless you're a landowner or you were gifted some or something like that, right? Um, so they'll make, continue to make dishes, but not in the way that I imagine a lot of that knowledge has been lost. I've noticed quite dramatically and quite, um, quite, you know, quickly at a very fast pace over the past 10 years. I've, I've noticed many of the younger generation really not having, not even very young, I would say even middle age, not having a, a recollection of a time when a specific dish was made with olive oil exclusively, for example, or made with, you know, whatever, you know, X ingredient. It's just not something that occurs to them. They're like, no, this is always, we make this with like, whatever, sunflower oil. I'm like, that didn't exist before, you know, the aid organizations brought it in, you know, or no, this is only made with, you know, whatever, white flour, or we don't use, you know, so this has become the reality. So in that sense, you know, continuing to preserve those, um, the dishes and the, and the way it speaks also is a way of preserving the history, right? It speaks of a time that, um, has been has been really forcibly removed from, from us, I think, from you know the consciousness of a lot of people. Um, and yet, for those who do remember the elders from the villages who came as refugees, cooking it is the, one of the only connections that they have to places that were are completely erased from the map and from existence, and you know what I mean, um, from the public consciousness. But they, we always say in our book that you know. Um, you can taste it in the dishes. You can taste these villages that you see nowhere else. You still taste them in the very specific way that they make kishik or, you know, um, variations of degga from the villages around Gaza or whatever, you know, the, the list goes on. I learned all these very, you know, um, specific seasonal unique dishes to each village. Uh, so in that sense, cooking becomes vital. You know, we talked about it, cooking as resilience, cooking as, um, yeah. But you were saying, Vivian? Oh, no, I mean, I, I'm also, of course, uh, equally horrified by the fact that a lot of 
uh, the foods actually, the, the quality has changed dramatically and so yes. the taste yes. has changed. So a lot of things that we tried to recreate, uh, the ingredients are not the same and so they don't taste the same. It's not that uh, sometimes that we forgot or that uh, it's just some things are just simply not available anymore. And exactly right. like you said, uh, sadly also, even, uh, even in the West Bank, uh, people can't afford olive oil right. anymore right. as much. And we're losing our trees, not just due to uh, the Israeli army, but also we're losing them because we have been enclosed and uh, ghettoized. And now you have developers who are basically vultures yes. who are cutting down these trees in order to build malls and right. turn more into consumers. Yeah. And so you see that, um, now people, even sometimes disturbingly on hummus would use canola oil because that's what yes, it is. Yes. And uh, sadly, this uh, nutritional issue is the worst, obviously, in refugee camps because- Yes, yes. Uh, Sorry, it's kind of noisy with me. Keep going. Yeah, I, yeah. I don't know you put mute, so. Yeah. So, and the flour itself uh, is so different. Uh, I mean, flour all over the world uh, is, is, is different and it's, it's a reason why a lot of people are getting sick and celiac disease and this and that. Right. Right. And if you speak to, um, I've been doing actually uh, an experiment on myself because one of the things I'm struggling to understand is like how come my ancestors developed wheat Right. And we're getting sick from wheat. Like, yeah. I don't feel so well when I'm eating bread, even though I love bread. But is it, so, do you notice what kind of, because I, you know, is it, what's the wheat that's being used, a specific variety? Yeah, you know? so obviously. The U.S., um, is it Palestine, is it, and what kind of wheat, even in, you know, is it? Yeah, well, there are two, two things that are going on. Uh, one major thing is uh, the uh, extensive use of glyphosate in, right. in growing uh, wheat. So that's happening all over the world. And um, also uh, the fact that, you know, it's bleached and it's processed. And then all the yeast, um, uh, all the yeast that uh, is used is synthetic yeast. So if you actually speak to, I mean, I, I, I can speak specifically about um, this elder woman, her name is Fadda. She's uh, from the Bedouin communities who used to grow the heirloom wheat varieties that grew also with no irrigation. Uh, and uh, she, she would say to me, you know, we only started to get sick when the bread from the market started coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because the bread from the market, and she knows, I mean, she's in her 90s. I hope okay. she's well in life. Uh, yeah. But she knows because she made her own, you know, mother sourdough. Right. And, and she would say, you know, we would borrow it from the neighbor and right. that, that's right. how you made bread, right? right? Uh, but today that is not the case. In fact, uh, bread doesn't feel so nutritious. But in the seed library, when we did work with the uh, heirloom seed uh, variety of uh, wheat, um, I was like, I'm sure, like, I'm not going to see the difference. Like, you know, no. this is an exaggeration. Like, really, is it that much? Uh, because people talked about this particular wheat that the flour, uh, right. when you made bread, that it tasted like cake. Hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, they called it Abu Samra, we call okay. it dark and handsome. One. <laughs> and, um, which is, by the way, what we call the seeds now. Um, oh, really? That's cool. Yeah, yeah. And we made a song about it and everything. People can look it up. It's called Abu Samra. Okay. About Zaid Hilal. He's a young singer who's up ah. and coming in Bethlehem. My daughter, my oldest daughter is really into all things, all Palestinian songs, so I'm sure. Oh, okay. I'll send you the link. It exists. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what I want to say is when we actually um, baked it the yeah. first time. Um, so you did the whole process. You, she, well, we planted it. We harvested it. Uh, we made frike from it. I was like, okay, I feel great. Nothing like. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then I was like, okay, it's a fluke, you know, frike, it's not the, right. but then we actually made the bread and indeed it tastes very, uh, very cake-like in the sense that it's filling, but it's also, it doesn't, it, it was just 
it felt nutritious. Like I ate bread and didn't feel like I'm about to collapse into a Was it the protein content also, you think? Like, because I know like double O flowers and things like that, cake flowers. Yeah, I think it does probably have a high protein content. I'm not, you know, I've never like actually dissected the, I don't know that, I'm not a scientist. But is this the same wheat that you sent me, Vivian? Vivian sent me some wheat seeds a few years ago. Oh, I don't uh, remember what I sent you. Yeah, and it was, of course, I don't have a huge, you know, I'll go out in a minute and show you, but I don't have a huge like farm. I just have my small garden, but we, when one section we planted the wheat with my girls and, um, you know, and it was cool for they've never seen wheat like, you know, so it grew. Yeah. And I remember as a kid going to my, um, Alirham or my grandfather's Bayara, you know, farm, small farm in, in um, Abu Holi, which used to be an area between Khan Yunus and Gaza that was very fertile, but it was surrounded by Israeli settlements. And in 2005 or so, four, they just, now it looks like a desert. They just demolished and uprooted everything in that area that the old, um, you know, Jumea's trees, sycamore trees, everything, the orange grove. But when, before that happened, I would go there and I would pick the wheat, you know, from the neighbors and my mom would be like, that's not our wheat, you know, and I would eat it when it was green. It was so yummy, the tender wheat. So I wanted to recreate that experience for them. So we planted the wheat seeds that you gave me and they grew and we, I showed them how, and then we made a small batch of frika. Oh. So it was very cool for them to see the whole yeah, process. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be nice to share with folks uh, who may not be familiar with how freak is made, how cool it is. Um, and actually, um, uh, uh, Amal, you, you, you just, we were just talking and you, I love what you said that, you know, you guys don't eat rice. Uh, and, um, and actually rice is such a modern introduction to Palestine. It, is. it absolutely is, yeah. Um, because, uh, you know, it was always about wheat and maftul and uh, all kinds of, and free right, right? We never, rice was, you know, what post, again, post 1940s, I want to say, um, after, especially when aid organizations introduced it. But I remember going back in the early 90s and people would bring like basmati, small bags of basmati from the Gulf with them. And the only thing that was available up to then was like the Egyptian small, medium grain rice um, in, in, you know, mashi and things like that. But even before they would stuff vegetables with burog, right? Not with rice. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I love the ceremonial uh, part about uh, making friki, you know, you harvest it and you make uh, a big yeah. fire and you throw it in and, and then you have to wait. It's, it's also a lesson in, in, in waiting and in processes, like you can't just um, yeah, put your process. hand in it, you have to wait till it cools off. And then you obviously have to talk to each other, make a cup of tea. Yeah. Uh, and then the process of literally fetic, which is why it's called freaky, uh -huh. to yeah. rub it with your hand and then really just blow uh, so that you are left with the, with the heavy yeah. seeds. Uh, and for me, I don't know, this whole process is so magical because... Uh, That's amazing. And again, but with these processes and seasons and um, experiences are the ones that so many Palestinians have been severed from, right? That connection to the land or the, what connects us to the land. And um, I imagine this is something that many people have, many Palestinians have never experienced, you know? Um, yeah, and sadly. <laughs> I mean, I, I am in my 40s and I only did this... Um, few years ago for the first time right so, and you you reminded me that um you know it's not just even within Gaza or Palestinians and diaspora on the outside but even within the West Bank you know I mean even we forget that that Palestinians even within the West Bank are separated from one another right between something like 400 different checkpoints and and uh, and you know and so it's very difficult for them there even to be able to cross and yeah and even if it's possible it became very uh difficult so for example in the villages where you know the the farmers and usually there were the women who would bring the vegetables to the city right uh, well right. now there are i mean they used to walk now there's the wall there are all these uh bypass roads uh they they can't come and if they have right. to come in uh, a shared van, then obviously this is also another 
of hassle and, and expense. Uh, and and even though like many of them still try to smuggle themselves yeah. into Jerusalem to sell, it takes a lot. I mean, you're literally risking your life. Absolutely. Uh, so people don't do that. And uh, it it became really such a hassle to be connected from the south to the north. Yeah. And I think this is exact, this was by design. I, I was about to say, it's about by design. And it's something that we probably don't talk about a lot, right? A lot of the emphasis tends to be on the overt kind of, you know, political landscape or the whatever, but this is what's kind of the, the you know, the detail. Well, yeah, I mean, you have a system of oppression that designed right. it this way, so you forget who you are. Absolutely. Uh, and so, but this is kind of what we also trying to do with the seed library, you know, yeah. one of the things we try to do often is actually do these gatherings where farmers we work with in the north can come to the south or vice versa and it's really amazing because uh you know i in initially took it for granted that of course they know they know what the other people do but they yeah. don't and actually how important these farmer to farmer knowledge exchanges uh were and are because um now we have a network of farmers who when one is having a hard time with uh, something that's happening in the north, they call somebody in the south and figure out how they did it. But most importantly, like uh, there are varieties that don't do well, uh, except in where, as we say in Palestine, these yeah. seeds know this soil and soil is different in different areas. Yeah, as so I've that heard diversity, my feral pepper experiment, although you would think pepper being, uh, as they say, uh, you know, uh, new world crop would have done well here but i'm gonna have to, to there's i can't tell you how many people i know that have smuggled the pepper or shatta from gaza through the Arab crossing because you're not allowed to take any kind of items so, yeah. you know um yeah so next time next time inshallah i'm gonna just someone was asking about what i just did here so i'm gonna recap quickly so i basically took one of my eggplants and i sliced it vertically you can do alternating peels if you like, so like peel a little bit off and on. You know, when it's kind of like tender and fresh like this, I frankly like, I love the, I just, that plant's my favorite vegetable in the world and okra, so, you know, I love the skin. But if you find the skin a little bit too much, you can do like peel one on, one off, slice it vertically. I sprinkled it with some salt and kind of let it sweat a little bit on some paper towels. And then um, you have two options. You can either drizzle it with some olive oil and uh, roast it, bake it, you know, grill it in a panini press. Mine like short circuited as I was here. So I ended up just doing a shallow fry and some olive oil, which is a traditional way it's made anyway. So I just love, nothing to me speaks more of summer than just like fresh fried eggplant, you know, which we often in Gaza, it's a very popular meal in and of itself, ma'ali, right? So just fried eggplant, flat potato, fried kusa, Middle Eastern squash. Um, and by the way, product placement, I use the, uh, you know, Middle East Children's Alliance olive oil from Yay! the Union of the Agricultural Worker Committees in Palestine, which you can get on the Shop Palestine store and support Palestinian farmers. Thing. Okay, so I use that olive oil. And so I fried up my eggplant, I put them on a paper towel. I'm just gonna flip them over now on the plate. And um, what I did is I made, somebody was asking what I did here, Mia and Diane. We basically mashed a few fresh garlic cloves from my garden with some salt until they were nice and creamy. And then we added uh, about two or three hot, I think we use jalapenos here, but you can use whatever you have. Uh, just don't use like Thai chilies, it's not the correct flavor. And then we mashed the chilies until they were nice and you know soft. And then we added uh, the juice of one large lemon and just mixed everything together. And that's like the, the dressing for you there. And so now what we're gonna do is just take these eggplants and basically just, you know, they're gonna fall apart in your hand, but you're just gonna tear them apart like this. And so it's kind of like torn slash ripped slash broken eggplant. How would you translate in Fessa? Uh, yeah, ripped. <laughs> yeah, like ripped eggplant, right? So and I'm not sure why, you can use a fork, but there's, I just love using my hands. There's something about, you know, you're making me salivate. I haven't had dinner. Wait, where? I, what's up with you? I thought you were going to make us mafusa. I am. And actually, my kusa is in the oven, but oh, you know, okay. it's taking way too long. I'm, I don't I know that it. we'll make it, but I yeah, have. Right? Is it, now, Vivian, ordinarily, they would put the kusa on a fire, right? 
Uh, yeah, and so the, basically it's, it's kind of similar to what you did, except we add yogurt. Okay, so uh, it sounds like the reason I'm asking you, and for people who are wondering what we're blabbering about, she was gonna, or she is, I guess, making a, another summer dish from, from Bethlehem that I wasn't familiar with. But the way she was describing it, it sounded very similar to Fatih right? Which is right? Which is a dish they, that I had, you know, shown um, Anthony Bourdain in Gaza, which is made with um, roasted kusa, um, eggplant, summer vegetables, and the baby wa young watermelon over a fire and mashing it together with olive oil, yogurt. Um, yeah, but you guys added this watermelon business. <laughs> We we like you know, that, that the watermelon the texture would be like a great offense to everybody in in. But you know what? Believe it or not, it sounds very odd. But a young, a baby watermelon tastes almost exactly like uh, any other. It's in the curcubit family, so it tastes just like a squash or, or it like very mild. Oh, right? we don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm trying to explain. It has a very. It's like essentially like a mild melon, right? Like if you yeah, ever have. Yeah. So I, I mean, I imagine it would taste. I, it would taste nice. Yeah. Uh, I've never tasted it. It would be interesting to taste it. But of course, it's, anything on the fire is delicious. It's and amazing. I actually have a video that I last fall I I record I grew some watermelon and I got some that were still hadn't ripened and I did, made a seven minute video of the whole thing. So I'll share it with you. It's here in my garden. So you see, I just kind of ripped them apart into like these nice strands. It's also like a nicer presentation, I think. And then I'm just gonna drizzle this on top. It's very simple, um, but it's like so yummy. It's just these simple flavors, you know? I love summer cooking also because you don't have to do much. It's not fancy, oh, yeah. but it's just, everything is so fresh and delicious that, you know, what more do you want? I don't like doing like heavy tabiq and stuff in the summer, you know? I'm just like, whatever's growing in the garden, whatever's around, what can we make with it, you know? Now my hands are all eggplant. And so, yeah, that's basically it. And then you just would eat this, you know, with this, mm, I wish you could smell this, it's, it's great. But this is the, the bread that we baked last weekend, you know, doing like a close up, yum, you know, do you see wow. all the coming up? Great. Yeah. So, and then it's just, it's really simple, right? And you would eat this probably with olives, right? Shatta, maybe more peppers. <laughs> I promised you the shatta, I'm gonna go get it while you talk. And then, you know, cheese, olives, very simple, like summer, my daughter. No, she's like those chilies are not looking so. <laughs> oh yeah, she didn't. She wasn't so interested in the chili. Well, you know, but last a few days ago, hunger is the best. You know, so that's how it kind of looks. If everyone. Wow, comes. it looks amazing. It looks yeah, amazing. and it's again when you put it on those nice hot eggplants, it just absorbs all the, you know, the, the hot eggplant absorbs all those flavors. So it's just um, amazing. We'll do a quick. Uh, and Vivian, can you tell us a bit about the preparation of your dish? Yeah, tell us. Go. I can, but honestly, it's still in the oven. I just moved to this apartment and I didn't realize this oven takes a lifetime. So uh, they're still not ready. But basically, I improvise um, and I roast whatever vegetables there are. Um, I, I don't personally like to add um, zucchini with eggplant. I feel like they should live alone. So, <laughs> uh, but uh, so this one that I was going to make was um, with uh, the zucchini. And usually uh, the zucchini uh, is, is really special, the zucchini we have in Palestine. And because it is very buttery, it's literally another variety that grows with no irrigation. Obviously, this is a variety I got in, in, in Cambridge in Massachusetts, and it it's probably You mean kusa, right? Yeah, kusa, yeah. Yeah. And um, so the actual flavor of the kusa itself is unique in that it's really it doesn't have a lot of water inside it. It's it's really buttery and uh, together. And so when you um, roast it, 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 it has this kind of like thick, but also a nice texture to bite into. And, and it's really simple. I smash it. And, you know, uh, in the South, in Bethlehem, we like to use a lot of uh, kishik, which is the uh, dried yogurt that is salty. Is the kishik that you use there, is it? 
do they make it in little discs like little round yeah or like it looks powder. like rock when we were kids we used to call it the rock yogurt uh, right so it looks like jameed but it's not right? it is jameed it is jameed is it i think it's different because we have kishik is really big in Gaza, but it's very different from jameed it is it is it is it's the jameed i mean i don't i use kishik i should have said jameed it's jameed and i'm saying i think they're two different I think they're two different products because the kishik. Yes, they are. I think they are as well. And actually, traditionally, people use this is jamid. Right. This is jamid, but in Gaza, it's they're similar, but the kishik is more of like a raw, rustic form, right? It has the in Gaza, the kishik is smaller and round, and then hard, like you're saying, but it has like the still the, the wheat kernels. You can see it. I'm I'm confused actually about this point. Uh, maybe uh, someone can clarify for us. Yeah, I know we are invited to talk about this because we should know. But but I actually I hear people. I didn't grow up hearing the word kishik as much. Okay. So for me, it might be what we would call something out, or I just don't know. But it's basically jamid, and I love jamid so much. Uh, and actually, we use something similar to the zibdi, eh? okay. uh, to kind of get just a little bit of it because it's very salty. But here uh, in the US, when I want something fresh, I just use regular fresh yogurt. And I also learned in Janine, when I lived in Janine, that people use fresh yogurt. So you smash the, the you smash the zucchini the and then Okay. You put yogurt, okay, uh, and uh, actually just like one thing of garlic that okay. also smash it. Yeah, and uh, I have le- a mint here, and I, I I don't care. I just put whatever I have growing in the garden. But, but like, did you maybe add should... whatever? There's basil. I'll add yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is, by the way, the way that a lot of the Falahim did it from my research. They were just like whatever. It yeah, to yeah, I'm a falaha. <laughs> I smash them. I'm a wannabe. I'm a, I'm a, you know, city girl wannabe falaha. So, <laughs> well, um, I'm falaha, and that's how we do it. And then we sprinkle olive oil, of course, on everything. Now, did you say that they would traditionally add kishik slash jami to it? Is, is that, did I hear you correctly? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so there are two kinds of mafusa. There's mafusa blaban and mafusa uh, bedun laban. Okay. Uh, and the mafrusa blaban is the one with uh, jameed. Okay. And actually, my father, who I, I bring up a lot because he is the master of, of these dishes. Yeah. You know? And my mom doesn't eat spicy food, but he will always make it and add chilies. Yeah, to yeah, it. yeah. Uh, and so, anyway. Uh, yeah, but then I, I discovered that in Janine, because there's more abundance of fresh yogurt uh, for longer periods of time in the year, they use more fresh yogurts, uh, which was very uh, uh, strange for me to adjust to coming from the South for a while, uh, because even Mensap, they will add fresh yogurt to it. Uh, but but Janine is, is fascinating like that. Yeah, I know that in um, southern Gaza, in Hanunis, and in some of the, you know, the um, border villages, they do something similar to what you're saying. They add, they make a kishik salad, like they'll add the kishik to, you know, either roasted tomatoes or, you know, mashed with yeah. garlic, etc. And they'll mix it all together in the, and they'll eat it with the bread, you know. So the idea of, you know, kishik is traditionally a very, very much a sort of nomadic slash, you know, yeah, um, and I and I really I I love that flavor and it's sour and it and, and actually it's very good for you. Oh, I love and it. I, I, you know, as a kid, I found it very strong, but as an adult, I love um, kishik. It's one of my favorites. So. Well, as a kid, my mom would hang, uh, you know, the the yogurt rocks, the jamid. Oh in yeah. A, in a room, you know, in a in a in a cloth. Yeah, and uh, when we were kids, this was like the sneaky activity of breaking one or finding a broken one to take a little piece and just suck on it all day. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to show. I want to show you what the kishik and I has have some in my fridge. While you continue to check on your squash, just give me a second. I want to. I have kishik from Gaza. Oh, okay. Let's let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Vivian. What are kind of like the classic flavors of of cuisine from back? Yeah, so I have to say, even though I am from Bethlehem, when I lived in Jenin, and when we talk about the Ghazan cuisine, uh, we're very boring in comparison. Uh, but we have our unique stuff. 
Um, but one of the main things I would say is um, we actually have a lot of fruits uh, and because we're, it's very hilly and uh, we're famous for our apricots. So we make a lot of products from apricots. Um, our cuisine also in, in, this, in Bethlehem uh, revolves around things like pomegranates. Uh, uh, we make something that I love the most in, in, Beth, in my town in Bejala that I think is, is very special uh, called Melban. And it's basically in grape season, we, um, we juice the grapes and um, we then add uh, a little bit of uh, flour and uh, we roast pine nuts and uh, you can add any nuts um, and uh, we then cook it together until it becomes kind of like a, a thick thing and then you bring uh, sheets uh, bed sheets uh, and you you then pour it on top and spread it and we leave it in the sun to dry for three four days and then you peel it and it's like, uh, it's like uh, jet, it's like, what do you call it? Fruit rolls. And I, I love it so much because during uh, Melbourne season, which is right now, uh, you know, Bejala becomes kind of this, uh, you know, tapestry of, of all these carpets of, uh, of grapes drying That's out. Amazing, so people still, make it like traditionally in that way? Uh, yeah, uh, not as many, obviously, sadly, but uh, it's still, it, you can still see it's, it's still there. And it's usually on people's uh, rooftops, on the balconies, you see sheets of Melbourne hanging off the balconies. Yeah. It's really a, a beautiful sight. Also, it's something you can eat all year round. You can yeah, 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 yeah. also store it outside. Yeah. So we're very uh, known, I think, in our area. We're doing stuff with our fruits, like also raisins and uh, figs and stuff like that. That sounds a lot like the Turkish, um, you know, they have also a similar fruit roll thing with uh, walnuts and uh, grape. And I wonder if it's a similar kind of... Uh, these are sheets. They're like really... Ah, uh, okay, okay. They're, they're like thin sheets. Ah, oh, interesting. So similar to Ahmad ad Deen, like the opera. Yes, but with great. great. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, I've never. Obviously, in Bethlehem, <laughs> also we like to make uh, wine and the Arab, particularly Arab, which is uh, traditionally people something made. Yeah. yeah. Mama, I don't know. Home so made. this is the Kashik, Vivian. You see, I do a call. Oh yeah, no, uh, that's that's. I understand now. I'm why I'm confused. Yeah, it's very different. It's kind of like a more rustic yeah. <laughs> raw version. The Jamid is a bit more refined. Like a Jamid is is more of like the just the the fermented. You know, I'm guessing it's more made with the powder, right? But the Kishik is made with a whole grain. At least the Kishik in the the Gaza villages is. You see, you can see the pieces of wheat. And the, ah, no, no, the, the Jamid doesn't have any, it shouldn't, although. Ah, it has, okay. It's so it's just yogurt. Pure yogurt. Okay. Pure so yogurt. Kishik is different in the sense that it's yogurt kneaded with a grain. Yeah, you, there you shouldn't, shouldn't be any. Okay. Uh, and any then they meat. leave it to ferment and then they sun dry it so that it, like, you know, so. Yeah, and it for us, the, if, yeah. if we buy Jamid that's, that has wheat, that's, we would think that it's cheated. Oh, interesting. Well, they're different products, I think. But anyway, when you said yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah. wow, this is so interesting. I learned this is amazing. And Jamid, before it's Jamid, before it's drying in the air, it is it's so tasty as a lick, like as a liquid. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It's my husband's favorite. So, but you know, again, these are the experiences again that I wish I could observe and experience and whatnot. But it's. Uh, no. Inshallah, one day we. Inshallah, inshallah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, are there? I, I wanna, I wanna go and take my laptop to sh shoot the, the garden. But um, I wanna see if there's any more questions before I transport my. Are there? I'm looking here on the thing. I'm reading. Um, I think we're we're Read. up to date, but I I'm curious um if you wanna speak to maybe, um what it means to be doing this work. Uh, from the United States diaspora and, you know, beyond the bounds of the physical bounds of Palestine. Is the question for me or for Leila? Amal, what time does this end? This ends at 8. 
uh, eight. Oh, okay. 35 minutes. Okay, I wasn't sure. What was the question again? Uh, I was just wondering if you could speak to what it means for you to be doing work uh, beyond the physical bounds of Palestine. Uh, okay. I'm guessing for both of us, Vivian, but, um, you know, uh, I mean, I always felt like, you know, somewhat of an imposter doing this, to be frank, in the beginning, because I didn't really know what I was doing. It was more of like I had this idea, but beyond that, I was like, well, who am I to be, you know, I'm not really an authority on anything. And, you know, I haven't lived there as, as much as I would have liked by circumstance and so on. So I always felt a bit, you know, part, partly a, some urgency to be aim, able to, you know, write this before a lot of this knowledge was lost, but partly like uh, some anxiety about, am I going to get this correct? Like, surely there'll be someone who will say to me, you didn't, you, this this was wrong or you didn't write you know you didn't put this version of it or whatever um so i really felt a responsibility to you know um do this correctly and as accurately as possible um but it wasn't easy because we didn't have the kind of access we would have wanted and in that sense we limited it you know to Gaza, but also because i was from the area and i i knew it better i think than most and um and because it was an area that I thought was much more misunderstood and was a key to kind of understanding the Palestinian, especially at that time, and it continues to be, you know, um, every few years on the media and the radar. But um, yeah, but it is always, for me, it's a very painful experience. It's not like someone writing, you know, sort of romantically about their whatever ancestors in Italy or something like that, or an Italian American cookbook. It's, it's an experience that's fraught with, you know, anxiety and, um, and uncertainty because you're you know you're writing about something that as you're writing it a lot of this is disappearing and and changing and um you know you, you're on one hand you want to be able to really give a beautiful portrait as and an accurate possible uh, portrait as possible of the area but it's also with the understanding that it, there's a, a lot of you know violence and ugly truths out there that um that's happening so you don't you need to be able to portray that as well and i think now that's kind of much more acceptable but at the time it was like no no just give us the food you know don't write about all the other stuff um but now i think it's sort of much more you know acceptable that there's an intersection that one can um approach this at and with um but it's certainly not, it is always, it gives me a lot of angst to be able to say, like, I wish I could travel there more. I wish I could, you know, even getting to Gaza now, just speaking to a cousin of mine that I met in Turkey, you know, I was there about a year and a half ago, but he went in the fall after not being able to go for nine years because the only passage to Gaza for, for Palestinians um, who are living, you know, abroad and have a Palestinian ID, even if you have a foreign passport, is through Egypt, right? So you can't go through, you know, the Jordanian crossing or through any of the Israeli entry points. And he was, and often young people of his age are denied entry into Egypt itself. So he initially was being denied into Egypt, so he couldn't even make it as far as the crossing. So finally he was able to get in and just going from Cairo to the border took like 24 hours and like multitudes of checkpoints and, and layers upon layers of like searches and corruption and, you know, that you're, you're not in the know, you're not aware of like what's going on, you're waiting and then you realize all these people are going in front of you and there's all these systems of bribes and by des some by desperation, some by you know greed has developed because there's no other way in or out and it's open for so. So just to be able to see his family it took him, I mean, it just was all, it was just, so this is what one has to endure just to be able to get back. So I recognize it's a privilege to be able to write this from the ab abroad, but I also recognize it's a huge responsibility, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's a privilege, but it's also not, <laughs> I mean. It's also uh, what? It's also not a privilege. No, exactly. Yeah. It, uh, that's exactly right. Like, it's, that's what I'm saying. It's, you're, you're conflicted. It's like survivor. Um, or whatever, like, you know, you want so badly to be able to, that's, I've said this before, of traveling in and out freely. And whenever we want and to do research and this and that. So a lot of it was done in under duress in extreme circumstances when we went it was like you know uh 12 and 14 hour power outages and um 
you know, extreme heat waves and, you know, no fans or air conditioning because there's no power and limited water. This is the daily reality, you know, people have managed to, you know, this is, but this is the conditions under which we did the research to give people a little glimpse of um, life. And despite all this, of the beauty and the, you know, the insistence to um, survive and to, you know, put meals on the table and to preserve the traditions and on and on um, that you can't quash. And again, it goes back to the importance of being able to, to, to cook and, and grow and, and prepare these meals, right? The insistence on defying whatever narrative they're trying to, you know, impose on us and to the world um, and writing our own narrative. Um, I think, I mean, that's what I see myself doing at least, so. Yeah, I mean, and we always have to kind of uh, hold these constant contradictions and dualities and somehow figure out how to walk in life with them. And I think it's not unique to, sadly, our experience as Palestinians. There are people all over the world who are having to do that. I'm thinking a lot about Afghanistan right now. And mm -hmm. if, if, I mean, I don't know how, how do you digest some of the footage and some of the envy, for example, outside of Afghanistan, and then you're running for your life, you'd rather die. Um, and, and, and so there are always these things like, as we're cooking, we're also contemplating very big questions about our, right. our, our survival as human beings, um, our doing as a human society, our participation or lack thereof or right or, so i think uh, there are no like easy answers for your yeah. question Amali. i just think that um each one of us will have to find um our, our little our little contribution our, the thread that we can add to this yeah absolutely thing, you know but i i actually also would say for me i am not so um, I mean, I, I don't see myself as someone working outside from the inside, I guess, because my experience has been different because I've been both places um, and I'm equally invested both places. And I'm also, I, I'm, I'm starting to learn about my role as more of a, of a pollinator. Like I, I plant the seeds and mm -hmm. I let others like I guide others into watering them but I'm not necessarily always there to do that and I that's and I such don't... a beautiful uh, way to put it <laughs> <laughs> yeah one has to know I that I it, because now I have all these pollinators in my garden it's like now the butterflies and <laughs> yeah I think I'm a pollinator not a not not a well I've been thinking a lot about this question because um you know I've been always jealous of trees because they kind of set root and they don't move um, but then I, i'm learning a lot about how actually trees do communicate so much and uh actually have a lot more movement. oh have you read the overstory yeah you should read have you read the overstory what is the overstory? no it's a book all about trees you should read it <laughs> and how they communicate and well i would love to read this book yeah but um yeah and anyway i just think it, using this metaphor to say that, uh, and not it's literal and it's metaphoric, that um, I think it's important the way I started to see our struggle, that how important it is to not see it as uniquely Palestinian in that, you know, our struggle is so connected to other struggles and other struggles are connected to our struggle. and. Uh, it's really important to live in, a, in the world comfortably uh, right. knowing all these injustices are happening. And so I'm not sure that as Palestinians that our job is just to focus on our own liberation, but I think it's how to, um, to actually provide new vision for liberation, even as we do it for ourselves, for the world, because also how can we also be conscious to break the old patterns of, you know, oppressor becoming oppressed, right. uh, oppressed becoming oppressor. And I think it's, it's a calling for humanity rather than, I mean, if we do that, then for me, Palestine would have that meaning of like, this is this Palestine I strive for. 
Yeah. Uh, and plants really give this opportunity to understand that truly like plants don't know borders. And so they understand that like trees do that, you know, your survival is, is dependent on the survival of other people and other beings. Um, so I don't know, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm also, you know, lucky that I can go back and forth to the West Bank, but still, uh, even within that, there are obviously all these limitations and burnouts and uh, yeah. mental breakdowns, <laughs> lots yeah. of those. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I mean, this is, I'm just sharing where I'm at, like how to expand that the work exists wherever we are. Yeah. Oh, no, for sure. And it is a beautiful way of thinking about it. I'm just trying to get my daughter to read Animal Farm right now. And so what you said about breaking the cycle, you know, of the, um, you know, the oppressed uh, becoming the oppressor or, you know, at least, uh, you know, renewing that cycle of violent tactics and so forth. But no, I mean, this is beautiful, um, Vivian, everything you said. How is the KUSA? I, I want to live it. I, I mean, the KUSA, again, is still in the oven. And My I see through. Do you have a gas stove? Because I sometimes put it right on the gas stove. Yeah, I do. But I think you guys are going to not see anything <laughs> from me today. It's it's just, put it, just put it I realized the whole time we're talking, it wasn't even on. So so listen, uh, just put it on the stove, on the gas. I do that sometimes. No, it takes like two minutes. Just go boom, boom. Yeah. In another episode, Leila. <laughs> Vivian's like, no, it's not going to happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, There's a question for you. Uh, someone's asking if you can share the story of the purple carrot seeds. Uh, you know, Vivian, I just tried to grow them. Well, I thought they were. I asked someone to bring them from Gaza that was there, but I think they misunderstood me because they weren't you know the ones in Gaza are the they look almost like beets like parsnips yeah yeah well they're they're almost they're bulbous like this they're not long yeah yeah that's the one yeah but I can't find them here so yeah well they're also hard to find as a seed in Palestine sadly too or yeah so the story of the purple carrot is that, uh, speaking of dishes from uh, Bethlehem and the South, um, there's a typical uh, Jerusalemite dish, which is uh, coring these delicious uh, purple carrots and stuffing them with lamb and rice uh, and cooking them in tamarind sauce. And it's one of my favorite, favorite uh, things to make and things to eat that I grew up with. Uh, and uh, when I returned back to Palestine in 2000, and, was it 2000 and I, I can't remember now, 2010, uh, I really wanted to um, have some purple carrots. I wanted to make it and I knew it was the right season, uh, but I kept asking people and uh, everyone said, oh, uh, you know, no, not many people are growing it now. You have to kind of order it or uh, you have to ask for someone to um, grow it for you and I was like it can't be that difficult come on now and so I started to ask around and the more I asked around the more people would keep sending me somewhere else um, and in the end I ended up going to this market where I heard that there is one guy that people order purple carrots from and uh, I got there to his uh, farm stand and I didn't see any. And I said, uh, do you have purple carrots anywhere? Like I've, I've looked everywhere. I really want some. And he's like, oh yeah, I kind of do. And I'm like, what do you mean you kind of do? You do or you don't. Um, and I always tell this story because it was so crazy and wild. Like I really uh, was so uh, shocked by what happened which is that he lifted this cloth and underneath was a cart full of them. Uh, and I had to like beg him, like, can you please like sell me, you know, sell me this cart, like, this crate. And um, he was like, no way, you know, somebody already ordered it. And actually it would have come up to probably around $65 if I wanted to buy the whole crate. Like that's how expensive because he's like, I, I don't grow it. I just grow it for specific people. 
anyway, uh, what was supposed to be just a trip to the market ended up being like a drug deal negotiation, uh, which resulted in him finally giving me uh, four or two, two, I don't remember. He just gave me like a couple and I was so excited. I went home and um, they had sprouted on the top a little bit. So uh, a friend farmer of mine was like, you know, since you're so desperate for them, why don't you uh, just, because obviously that wasn't enough to even make the dish. It's like, just put them in the ground and wait for them to seed. And that's exactly what we did. And uh, we were able to have the seeds uh, and, and then be able to share and grow. But uh, that's the story of the purple carrot because it's, it, it was such a, it's such a, crazy thing that you know to to find a carrot would require so much effort uh and i think that was part of why i wanted to do this work it's like it shouldn't it shouldn't it shouldn't be this much effort to find a carrot but so you know, you're, like, you're still struggling to find it well the thing is you reminded me so in Gaza, they're actually really easy to find when they're in season in, I was uh, just going to say, because Gaza is the place yeah. where we could find them easily. That's exactly right. So I can get them from Gaza, which means yeah. that I would love to have some Gaza ones. So in the spring, I remember the few times when I was living there, I mean, multitudes of them, you go and they're every and they're beautiful. They're, and actually they're described in medieval Islamic cookbooks, you know, as the original carrot, right? So it's really, I'll say, if you're interested, I'll send you the passages, but they it. describe them as carnelian rubies of something or other because they were these beautiful, again, they almost looked like beets in their color and they were kind of stocky like this. And, um, but yeah, we, same thing. Sometimes it, you know, either made with tamarind or sometimes with, um, sometimes with, you know, either lemon or whatever was available to make, make it sour, right? But um, one, you one add the lemon in the end to the sauce. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to remember what how else they. I can't remember, but it's the same idea. But anyway, one year I really wanted them, and I was here in the U.S. and my parents were coming, so I was like, "Do you think you could try to bring?" Oh me? my god! Yeah, they keep really well, right? They're they're a root vegetable. I know. It's so, just that the uh, yeah, and they got someone to <laughs> yeah, I know they got someone to like an Uruhum to core them because they're really hard to core. You have yeah, to core. I was gonna ask. So you. somebody cored them there, and they got like a kilo, two one two kilos, I think, and he just put them in a bag, and he, they made it across from Gaza. I don't. This was many many years ago, all the way to the U.S. and. It was amazing. And we, we like stuffed. It was like, it made my year. Oh you know? my God. I love this story so yeah, much. Yeah, 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 yeah. So no, when I, when I have a plan in my head, my husband knows, I, Lezim and Afiza, like I have to implement the plan. I'm like, I don't care what happens. I will, you know, smuggle this across, like, you know, come hell or high water. So, you know. Well, you know what's so amazing? When you land uh, and you're like picking up your luggage and it's a flight from Amman, for example, I mean, literally the 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 belt, <laughs> where, you know, the where people pick up the bags. Just it's reeks of like zatar I know, I know, I know, I know. And the funny thing is, this when I just came back from Turkey, I also smuggled a specific kind of Turkish melon because I loved it so much. Seed with me, and um, anyway, is this beautiful seed that's like carved. No seeds, like to plant to grow. Yeah, yeah I know there are some uh, cool. Oh, oh okay. There. No, I just dried them myself from a melon that I ate. But um, the thing is, they stopped making you fill out the form. You don't have to declare anymore. They just kind of say if you have anything you want to, you know. <laughs> so it's not as strict as it used to be, you know. Not that I'm encouraging anyone to smuggle stuff, but, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I've never smuggled anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> have you ever seen the movie America where, where the mother leaves Bethlehem, the divorced mother with her son? And her grandma, the grandmother, the teta, as all Palestinian grandmothers, sent her with like cheese and cucumber sandwiches. I, this was my experience growing up. Every time we'd visit Palestine, my grandmother, when we were leaving to the Jisir, she would always send us with, with che white cheese sandwiches and khyar. I don't know why. It I mean, was, that's awesome though. Yeah, I mean, yeah so but then she takes a thing of mahmoud with her, right? Oh and yeah, that's how she loses the money in the movie. She hides the money and then the customs takes it. And while she's not paying attention, the son is like, Mom, they're saying, do you want, they, they have to, do you want these cookies? They have to take them. They have to throw them away. And she's not paying attention. So they throw all her money away with the cookies. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I remember that that uh, that part of of the film. Yeah, but I mean, it's because we're always trying to um, remember who we are, you know, and and not be so absolutely, absolutely. separated. I was trying to show you guys. Then it started raining again, but the the puke the carrots that I have because I think I did manage to grow a few of the red ones. They, they didn't come out as um, round, you know, as the ones, but I did get a few. So I was kind of excited about that. But now it started raining again. But, but maybe Leila, you can tell us what we're looking at behind us. Oh yeah, sure. <clears throat> maybe I can pop quickly. So this is just a. This is a my first year with the uh, grapes. Of course, the climate in Maryland is not as um, suitable because it's quite humid for grapes but you know in Gaza and in Hebron they're really famous for grapes so in Gaza there's so it's a specific area of Gaza that's really famous for its green grapes um, seeded by the way so I know a lot of Americans are not used to eating seeded grapes but they're just incredible the once you've had like actual grapes from a vine with the seeds you'll never go back to the crap that they call seedless grapes you know right I never uh, buy grapes in the United States yeah, yeah, but I, I didn't get a chance to make what I, I, I was, I'm trying more and more as much as I can to like harvest, you know, do things like in season, use every part of the plant the, the way that they would in Palestine. So this is a whole thing of um, Greek oregano. I tr Zata, it won't grow perennially here. Unfortunately, I tried, um, but I'm still working on trying to grow it, like, you know, cultivate it. So we'll see. That's my goal. So yeah, there's a, there's a few grapes here, you see which is still it's the season now but not much <laughs> but i love my garden let me see if i can pop over and show you the um i think i should if i don't use the connection but here's my more light in maryland than i do in new england this is weird because we're further south uh, so you see i have my <laughs> my okra not much south but yeah a little bit right uh -huh. so i have some this is a red variety which I love. I just love, I told you, okra and eggplant. I just find okra. I learned about the beauty of okra in Gaza first when we were photographing the book. And I just saw these stunning, they get very big, as people, some people know, some people might not. And the most incredible blossoms, right? They're related to hibiscus. And it's just the most beautiful plant. Like, I don't think it occurs to people that okra is such a beautiful plant, but it is. So you know? beautiful. Yeah. And yellow and flowers. Yeah, and I have, you mentioned white cucumber. I imagine you're talking about fa'uz, right? I have some here growing. I, I don't know if they're your seeds or not, but I have, you see, I have um, some of them growing here. So, and then I showed you my mluchia, right? That's what we were going to make last time. Uh, no, you didn't show but me in the garden. I was. Oh, incredible. I didn't. Yeah, yeah. This is my... Um, this so is, how many cuts do you get every year or you, you know what i i usually get about four you know this year i started them a little later so i might not get as much but they it, you know we've had it's been colder than usual but i usually get a good amount i i don't have a huge space so i divide it up accordingly and the other thing that i grow here from palestine is um uh chard so i don't know if you guys use it in, in bethlehem a lot, yeah, yeah. Do you? Okay, we, it's one of the main greens that we use. So you see, this is Palestinian. This one, I got seeds from Gaza. So this is actually a Palestinian chard. I and love this chard. And also we roll it like the grape leaves. Yeah, that we don't do. So I'm curious to try that. It's but you, you see the Palestinian chard. Yeah, I've heard like like Malfouf Vivian or what? Yeah, yeah, we make it just like what the way. Okay, okay. Yeah. So this, you see, it doesn't grow as big as the American or Swiss chard. And so I was really excited that my friend Henny was able to get me these seeds and they grew really well here. And then um, I'm trying to see if I can show you the carrots. It it's a little bit bigger. bigger though. This is a special. No, no, the one in Gaza only grows like this big. It doesn't grow. Ah, so this must be a Gaza variety. Yeah, yeah, I would yeah. I'd love to have. I don't know. Can you wait for it to seed and make seeds uh, for this us? Is, yeah, this is a different carrot. I was, I, huh? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. I leave it. I don't take it out. So I was trying to see if I could show you one of the red carrots, but I don't think that I, I got one. Unfortunately, they're all different varieties here. And then well, one other thing I was going to show you. Do you guys have some Um, 
Yeah, it's not. I mean, now it's, this is called. This is different than the actual one that goes in the wild, right? That's yeah. more like. Um, yeah, yeah, we forage it and eat it. Yes, exactly. This is I, but you know, it's the same similar flavor, but it's not the same. But I use this to make hamasis, which we do with the wild. It's um, it's a dish with lentils that we make with the forage type of so the sorrel, right? The lambs or the, and we basically boil it and then we get that sour flavor we mix it with lentils and then i we, love it's, that, that it's a really uh, it's a really popular dish in Gaza in the spring actually usually so yeah so that was my garden lots of basil we use a lot of basil in Gaza too so we use that now with the okra we have a dish with okra and lentils and then we finish it with basil and garlic on top that's a really popular dish in some of the villages so sounds terrible Leila. no it's so good no i'm joking so oh good. i thought because i have people who are like that's disgusting what is that so but it's amazing <laughs> oh man yeah so anyway i get very excited by these simple flavors but it just helps me personally you know i think for a lot of palestinians who grew up um you know just a way like what does it mean actually right i always ask myself that what does it mean when we say we're from somewhere, you know, because I think as Palestinians, more than anyone, we, we grew up somewhere, we were born somewhere and grew up somewhere. And many of us, like in the case of my husband, have never even been to the place that we call home, right? Um, so for me, you know, food and planting, and it makes it much more real, like something tangible that I can taste and, you know, uh, feel and remember and so on. But it's all of these, you know, small experiences that you were talking about that are so amazing as a child, you know, the, the jameed and the grape, yeah. the malban and so on. Well, your garden is gorgeous. Oh, thank you. It's, it's not that big, small. I didn't introduce you to my chickens. One of them is shatta. Wow, that's my like favorite thing to make. I know, I think when, because it's raining, I think that they went into sleep. But <laughs> yeah, I do have shatta, shatta the chicken and, you know. Yeah, they probably went back to their to their coop. There's another question from the audience. Yeah. To both of you, what fruit do you miss most from Palestine? Ah. Oh, oh gosh. You know, speaking of fruit, what about you, Vivian? What's your favorite? Well, I'm from Bejala, so I miss our mistikawi mishmish, which Ooh. is uh, apricot that does not taste like any apricot. What about tea? <laughs> I do miss teen a lot, mm. uh, but I don't miss teen as much as I miss the mishmish. I'll tell you what I miss the most. Although I will say the mishmish that we had when I, when I was in Turkey, I don't think in my life I have ever had, you know, better apricots. But what I miss I the most- miss the bejala, like. I haven't yet. It, I did maybe once, right? But a long time ago, 2001. Um, Jawafa, I don't know if you have it there. Guava. But yeah, the, it's, the, the, it's coastal. We don't have it. Right. Well, we, we no, it, but that's exactly right. It's coastal. So the, the guavas that grow specifically in Rafah in southern Gaza. I, like in my life, I have never had guavas like this. They're not the ones that, you know, frequently here you get the small Mexican ones or the pink ones. These are big. Um, and they're they're pale, pale lemon-like in color and kind of custardy from the inside. So fragrant. My, I could literally eat a whole that that's to me the thing i miss the most because you can't get them anywhere you know so and it's a it's a fall fruit right so you can only get it in like uh november or something like that October, yeah, i should totally introduce this to my dad that's exactly <laughs> what he talks about all the time like what he, he wants the Gaza Gawafa. oh really so, <laughs> again it's one of the 87 and he hasn't had it in i don't know how long i don't oh, know oh man uh, one day i would yeah Wow, my mom, it's her favorite fruit. But again, growing up, I, I was like, what is this fruit? It's like seedy and what's what's the appeal about it? But now I totally get it. It's just amazing, amazing and addictive. So I would love to meet your dad. He sounds like amazing. <laughs> I want to interview him. Well, I can make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it looks like we're running out of time. Um, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight and for your wonderful questions. You can follow Vivian and Layla on social media. That's uh, at Gaza Mom on Twitter and Instagram, at Vivian.Sensor. 
Um, and of course, go check out the amazing work of the Palestine Heirloom Seed Library. I just have a few things to mention as we wrap up. Uh, Mecca's next event is on August 26th. It's, uh, Mona Hajar Halabi is celebrating her new memoir in her mother's footsteps, a Palestinian refugee returns from home. And you can find more info for that at meccaforpeace.org. Um, and I'd also like to invite you to visit Just World Ed's online learning hub, Beyond Survival, on food sovereignty struggles in Palestine and elsewhere, which you can access at bit.ly slash beyond s resources. And I think Dean is going to be sharing the links with everyone and some exit slides as well. Um, but today's webinar has been organized jointly by Just World Educational and the Middle East Children's Alliance. This programming can really only be done with your support. So please consider adding both organizations to your giving list. Uh, the third edition of the Gaza Kitchen is out now and you can order your copy today. Um, think, yeah, buy Lila's book, people. Yes, it's amazing, <laughs> beautiful. You'll love the recipes, you'll love the stories. Um, there we go. And your feedback is very important to us. So as you leave the webinar, please take a couple minutes uh, to fill out the exit poll that Zoom will redirect you to. Um, and Vivian, Leila, thank you both so, so much for everything you shared tonight. Um, you've given us so much to take away and thank you to everyone in the audience for being a part of this special evening. Um, and thanks again to Penny and Dean and to our sponsors, Just World Ed and Mecca. So thank you and good night. Thank you. Thank you everyone.